All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. First of all, thank you so much for joining our webinar today, Understanding the Fiduciary Process. My name is Gina Buckles, and I'm one of the members of the 401k Plan Professionals team. And a little bit about our team. We are comprised of, uh, there's five of us, Jessica, Jenna, Kristen, and Kelly. And again, we just wanna thank you for your time and thank you for your business today. Just a few um, notes about our webinar series. This is the fifth of five webinars that we have conducted in 2019. We're excited to continue the series in 2020. Um, if you have any ideas, hot topics you'd like us to talk about, please don't hesitate to share those with us. We really appreciate it. And I do also want to let you know that if you have registered for this webinar, please know that we will be sending out a recorded link so you can revisit it, you can share it with a colleague, and also, I do want to remind you, as with any of these webinars, you can always um, send us questions throughout on the chat box or on the Q&A. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speaker today, Tim Rochevitz. I got it. I've been practicing that for a good uh, couple minutes. Uh, but I'm, we're really excited to have Tim with us today. Tim is with Federated Investments, and he is a senior vice president. He's also a senior uh, plan retirement plan consultant. And Tim, Federated has done an enormous amount of work on, on, this, on this topic, on the fiduciary planning process. Can you tell us, first of all, why, why is it so important? The easy answer is, is because the Department of Labor is actually asking. Uh, the DOL uh, oversees uh, the 401k market. They are the regulator, and they are now actually starting to ask plan sponsors during plan audits, by the way, have you ever received any formal fiduciary training? Most people who sit on a retirement committee uh, have never received any formal training. Uh, as a retirement committee member, your goal would be to do your best job, but in a lot of instances, you're not really sure how to do what I call the right things right. So that's what today's webinar is all about, is trying to teach, teach you some basic fundamentals. If you're on a retirement committee, here are some, here are some things that you want to be doing, kind of create a checklist of, okay, here's what we should be doing. If we're not doing these things right now, we should probably do that. Uh, going forward in the future. So the DOL is asking. So that's number one reason. Number two is the DOL is very busy. Uh, they have hired, uh, they have almost doubled their force, uh, workforce of enforcement officers over the past year. And, and actually those numbers show up if you look at the enforcement efforts, recoveries from enforcement efforts uh, by the DOL over the past year. Uh, in 2018, enforcement actions, money recovered from enforcement actions was about $1.1 billion. The year before that, it was about $615 million. So they almost doubled the amount of money that they recovered from enforcement efforts. And truth be told, a lot of those investigations, a lot of those audits are actually triggered by a phone call from a participant of a retirement plan to their local DOL office <coughs> with, a, with a complaint. And so when I do these webinars, I think one of the things I always want to emphasize is whether your plan is small, a million dollars or $2 million or it's $50 million or $100 million or bigger, if the person who's calling on the other end of that line to the DOL office has a valid complaint, it really doesn't matter what size your plan is. So no plan is ever too small for the DOL to conduct an audit. So the purpose of this workshop is to make sure that we're doing all the things right. So in the event that there actually is an audit, the DOL will come and say, well, heck, you're doing all these things great. Uh, try to maybe improve on this one thing, but that's what the goal is today, is to prevent any big issues in the event the plan is ever audited. Great, yeah, good, great information. And Tim, I know one of the, the things that Federated has designed is this fiduciary planning process. It's a great guide for plan sponsors. And I will remind anyone uh, at the close of, of this webinar, I'll share my contact information. If anybody would like us to send one of these guides to them, just shoot me an email, we'll be happy to do that. But one of the reasons I like the guide so much is that it, it really, 
um, steps, it, it presents five easy steps, I think, pretty, pretty logical steps to start the fiduciary process. And the first step is to establish and document fiduciary goals. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit? I will. Uh, in fact, I'll share a quick story about the importance of documenting, in this case, step one, establish and document fiduciary goals. So real life story, uh, how, does a, how should a fiduciary think? Uh, my wife and I were having some work done uh, in our at our house uh, last summer, and we were having a uh, a back porch screen, a back porch put on with a screen and everything. And so I had a process, and I went out and talked to two or three builders, and I looked at their bids, I looked at their experience, their qualifications, came up with a decision as to who I thought was someone who would do the best job for me. Uh, and hired the person they were going to get ready to come out and the builder called me and says hey we're going to we're going to deliver this big trash bin and your uh, we're going to put it on your driveway it's to put all the excess uh, materials that we're using to to do your work i said well actually i just had my uh driveway redone repaved he says oh don't worry we're not gonna we won't we won't create any issues we'll put it on skids and that's not a problem but thinking as a fiduciary i decided that the day before he would come out, I went and took some, took my cell phone, took a, had my camera and pictures, I videoed it, I took pictures, a builder came out, did the work, and then when they were taking the skid off, I noticed, wow, look, we have some scratches here. So, thinking as a fiduciary, I called, I called the builder back and said, hey, I said, by the way, great job on the house, but I noticed there were some big, big, pretty big scratches on my driveway, and the builder said, well, how do you know that they weren't there before the construction started? And being thinking as a fiduciary and docu making sure I documented my decisions and documenting everything, I was able to send him a picture. And so his response was, okay, Tim, send me a, send me a bill. I'll take care of it. So <laughs> the importance of documenting your decisions is essential because in the eyes of the DUL, if you don't document it, if it's not on paper, you didn't do it. I mean, that's that that's the truth. Uh, so you need to document your decisions. The DOL has more of a concern with making sure that when whatever decisions you make impacting your retirement plan, that number one, you have a process so that you put some time and work, due diligence, and looking at having a process and trying to learn everything you need to know to come up with a decision. And then the second part is the decision. So have a process in place. Secondly, document that process. Uh, that's extremely important. The DOL is more concerned with making sure that with information, that process, you have a process and you, uh, you know, try your, to your best ability to come up with the best decision than the actual decision. And we all, we're human, we all can make mistakes. You know, you can hire an investment manager and their fund and they're performing. That's not as important to the DOL as, hey, did you do your deal due diligence? And furthermore, did you document how you came up with those decisions? So of the five steps that we're going through, this is the, the most important. You, you simply need to make sure that you document uh, all of your decisions. In the event of a plan audit, the, dot, the DOL, for example, with retirement committee meeting minutes, they'll go back as far as three years in looking at uh, those those minutes. So it's extremely important to have a process for all of your decisions and then be able to document those. So that's step one, and in my opinion, is well, by the far most the most important. important. Yeah. 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 And you're right. Those investment committee meetings, um, I know with our clients, we make sure someone's always taking the minutes, um, the, the, the process, the thought process is always documented in those minutes. So again, just retention of those minutes, very, very important. Understand your role as a fiduciary. I think this is something that causes confusion with a lot of people. A lot of people don't know um, that they may be a fiduciary in their plan, uh, even if they're not a named fiduciary. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so there, there are a lot of gray areas in what is a fiduciary. In the eyes of the DOL, it's very clear cut, and that is anyone who has uh, exercises control uh, of the assets of the plan. So every plan must have a named fiduciary. But on a retirement committee, you might have 
let's say you have a five-person retirement committee and each of those five people has a voting share in how decisions are, are actually made, that's where the gray area comes into play. While there may be one named fiduciary on the 5500, if you have voting, if you're one of the people who do vote on issues, service providers uh, that impact the plan, uh, in my eyes, you would be a fiduciary. So you, may, you want to be very careful, especially if you are not a named fiduciary in terms of like retirement committee minutes, uh, you want to be very careful about, you know, if, if there are five of you voting and only one named fiduciary uh, do well in the event of a plan, I'd say, wait a minute, there's five of you who are voting. Uh, but so being a fiduciary, there's, there's really one question that you have to answer whenever you make a decision impacting the retirement plan. And the question that you need to answer is, is this in the best interest of the plan or the plan participants? Mm -hmm. If the answer to that question is yes, then you are acting as a true fiduciary. Yeah. Uh, if the answer is something other than the plan participants or the plan benefits, then that's not the right answer. Right. Um, but there are some gray areas in terms of who is or who is not a fiduciary, but the golden rule is uh, you have to do what's in the best interest of the plan. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Step three. You already touched on this just a little bit, but what's a good way to manage the committee meetings and, and, and how often should committee meetings occur, the process and bylaws? Um, if you can elaborate on that just a little bit more. So retirement committee meeting, retirement committees are built a lot of different ways, depending on the size of the company. Some retirement committees could be one person. Mm -hmm. uh, some could be, you know, two, three, five, the bigger the, the, the company, the bigger the plan, the bigger the committee. Uh, it, it is suggested that uh, your retirement committee have, a, have an odd number of committee members. That's a good point. So whether it's one, three, five, seven, the reason for that is in the event of you are all voting on, you know, on issues impacting the plan, you're never going to have a tie. So it's best to have, it's best to have an odd number uh, of individuals on your retirement committee. Uh, the most successful retirement committees meet uh, twice twice or more a year. Two is pretty good. I know that sometimes it's difficult to even get groups together at least once a year, uh, but the more often you can you can meet, uh, the better two times is is actually kind of the standard if you yeah. can meet twice a year. And a lot of times, if you can't get the group together twice a year, maybe one of those, you can do a webinar. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to get people, just to get people uh, together. And I also would, su would suggest that for retirement committee meetings, um, that you make sure that the meeting is set well in advance so that all the committee members are able to put that on their calendars and also to seek input from the uh, from the committee members on exactly what they want to hear, yeah. what they want to talk about, right. so that it's not just your meeting; right. it's actually their meeting. They have a skin in the game, and they've they've decided on here's what are some of the important things that we're going to talk about. I do want to talk, uh, just share very briefly what what I'm hearing that kind of what's what's on the minds of, re of uh, retirement committees today. Uh, number one is cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, cybersecurity is a huge issue, and it's something that the DOL will be providing some gui be providing some guidance on That's here right. going mm -hmm. forward. But right. again, uh, we talk about you need to have a process. Uh, what is the process going to be for cybersecurity? Mm -hmm. I also have heard a lot of discussion recently uh, regarding how do retirement committees? How are you working with participants who have recently left the company? but whose assets still are in the plan Good. because you are actually required to be able to provide those individuals who have left the company right. who are still in the plan with the same information, right. communication. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's difficult when the people move, right. um, but it's actually been pretty, I've, I've <coughs> excuse me, I've, I've heard uh, on a couple different instances from uh, advisors that I work with who are working with plan audits right now and it was because of the issue with not staying in contact 
those. with the participants who right. who have left the, the company but have not left the plan. Right, and and the challenge there is, as you know, plan sponsors, you can only force out those people that have less than five thousand dollars. So you know, if a plan participant leaves and they have over five thousand dollars, you are still a, a fiduciary to them. You still um, you still have to communicate with them, provide them with notices, and 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 we understand what a challenge that is. Yeah, it's it's. So addresses, people move, addresses change, uh, but the phone numbers typically don't change. Mm -hmm. If all of us who have cell phones, mm -hmm. even if you change providers, you want you still want your own your 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 old number. So that phone number is actually probably a more accurate way of keeping in touch with people than an actual address. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Okay. Good. Good tips on step three. Uh, step four: Develop an annual fiduciary calendar. I know something um, our team has started to do more is is to have a fiduciary calendar, or at least um, keep track of the different things that we do throughout the year. Whether it's um, employee education, um, obviously the committee meetings, maybe having webinars, special client events to educate them. So um, why why is this this part important? Is it is it just keeping track of the dates and the events and and being able to show an auditor um, that you are following a process um, and you are doing more than? I think it, for just for practical purposes, for those of you who are on a retirement committee, you're probably in human resources. You're running the business. You wear a lot of different hats. It's easy to get sidetracked, and retirement, retirement, it probably is in your on your mind 365 days a year. You have health care to worry about. You have, you're running your business. You're doing, you're wearing a lot of different hats. So this this calendar simply keeps some key retirement dates uh, in your mind, so that you're ready, you're prepared for whether it's a committee meeting, uh, just to keep it out there in the forefront because it, it is a, it's a it's a big service. Uh, it's, it's a it's a huge benefit that your employees receive. Um, yet we also know just in day to day activities, it's probably it's not the only thing on your mind. So it's just a way to keep keep retirement uh, on your mind during key dates throughout the year. Great. And do you suggest if our clients, if they host an employee meeting, individual, and they have individual sign-ups where they meet with us, um, probably keep that documentation as well, I assume. Absolutely. The yep. more information you have, the better to show that uh, you are, you're, you're hosting events, uh, you're, you're having meetings with your employees regarding retirement plan, retirement plan, to show that, to document that, you know, we are, we're engaged with our with our employees. Our goal is to hopefully provide them with the best alternative or the best opportunity to save for retirement. So the more information you have to document on how you're doing that, the better. Great, great. And step five, um, important process that's near to dear to our heart. Obviously, we're we're involved with this process as well. But important piece is obviously in uh, in the investment monitoring and, and oversight process, um, ensuring that you have an investment policy statement and you're following it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about, um, or give us some tips on, on how to manage this stuff? So with the investment policy statement, it's, it's, it's as important, it's just as important with the investment policy statement than it is with your retirement plan document, <coughs> excuse me, that you follow that to the T. Whatever is in the investment policy statement, whatever is in the retirement plan document, you want to you want to be familiar with what's in there, and you want to make sure that you do follow it. Because the first thing the DOL will ask for in the event of a plan audit is, let's see your let's see your plan document, let's see your plan document, mm -hmm. and then secondly, do you have an investment policy statement? Yes. So whatever is in there, uh, the better. Uh, investment policy statements are. You, know, you you don't want them too specific, but you also don't want them uh, so, you know, you want to have details, but you just want to make sure whatever details you have, and, you know, we're going to uh, monitor these investments uh, on a quarterly basis, and here's our criteria for adding investments in the, in the portfolio, in, in the lineup. Here's our process for uh, taking investments out based on performance. So whatever is in there, you just want to make sure uh, that you do follow it. Right. And I know many of the investment policy statements that we've helped draft with our committees, they, they, they might suggest um, a criteria to put a fund on a watch list. 
but it but but there may be some some reasons and again you document these reasons why you you may not want to remove that fund maybe it's been managed for 30 years it's historically done fantastic its management style has just fallen out of favor so even though it's fallen below the criteria we're going to keep it on the watch list but if you can continue to document um, why you'd like to re retain that fund, and if it makes sense, uh, that's, that's, that's absolutely fine. So I think that's kind of what you were getting to. You may not want to have anything that's too hard and fast um, to remove it, um, because we do want to consider everything uh, before we remove a fund and plan. True, very true. One of the things I'd also like to mention, uh, monitoring fees for reasonableness. So going back to my story about hiring someone to, to make an addition to my house, I did not hire the cheapest uh, provider. I looked at experience. Uh, I relied on references uh, from people who had used this builder. Um, and cost was not the only factor in my decision, such as much like in the uh, retirement plan world, uh, costs, according to the DOL, DOL, need to be reasonable. That doesn't mean you have to hire the cheapest right. of the service providers, um, but it's about fees that are reasonable. So that's why we, we suggest that your plan be benchmarked right. uh, every three to four years mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that the costs for the plan um, are reasonable, not cheapest, but right. reasonable. reasonable. I think it's important to make a distinction yeah. there. Exactly. And I know we've had clients that, you know, after we've benchmarked their fees, they might look at them, they realize maybe they're not the cheapest, but they're also getting some services and some value adds that are extremely important to them or their plan participants. And you can justify the cost and, and establish that as, as reasonable. So again, I, I absolutely agree. Um, reasonableness is, is, is a better um, criteria than definitely not necessarily the cheapest. So. Fantastic. Um, well, we have um, concluded the five steps, and I'm just going to open it up. If anyone has questions, again, feel free to uh, submit those through the chat box or Q&A. It looks like we do have, have uh, one question here, and I'm just going to read it. I'm a volunteer on a church committee. We have three to four million in assets. We met with Jessica. We meet with Jessica uh, Valen at our office um, two times a year. I'm not sure about our note taking or documentation. Am I vulnerable or liable? Um, and should I be nervous? Um, great question, and, and I, can, I can speak to this. Um, if we are part of your invest, investment committee, um, and we typically are, we are always taking minutes. Um, we always ensure that you have an investment policy statement. From time to time, we'll come back and review that investment policy statement at the beginning of an investment committee meeting. Uh, but we do always ensure that, that there are minutes being taken at a meeting if we're there and, um, and ensuring that we're following the investment policy um, you know, as, as closely as possible. So you know, as, as long as you have that type of a documentation, um, and again, in those minutes documenting any decisions that are being made and why, um, you're, you're doing exactly what the Department of Labor um, would, would recommend. Any, anything to add to that? Yeah, the DOL, uh, they will look at those committee minutes. Uh, as long as you are able to document, here's, here's what we discussed uh, in a clear and concise manner, uh, that's, what they're looking, that's what they're looking for. Great. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Any other, any other questions people would like to submit? All right. Um, just a reminder, um, again, this is um, our team. We want to thank you for your time today. And also remind you, my contact information is there along with Tim's. If you would like us to send you one of those, um, one of the, the plan sponsor um, guides to your fiduciary process, again, we kind of hit on all the steps today. But if you'd like that, just shoot me an email. Be happy to get that to you. Um, and also in closing, I'm just going to leave the disclosures. Uh, there um, as we're required to as well, but also want to thank you um, for your time today. Please reach out if you have any questions. Um, have a great day, and thank you, Tim. That was We really appreciate your time as well. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.